everything worked out. So maybe everybody can hear. Got two speakers in the back and two new ones there. We're going to be working on those and a couple of microphones and a new projector. So as soon as we get time to get all that done. But uh, some updates before we get going here. Remember, coming up May 11th, uh, 3G get together again. We're going to have a skeet shoot uh, like last year, so be planning on that. And then uh, coming up uh, this Sunday, April the 14th, at 3 p.m., there's going to be a wedding shower for Jaron and Elijah. They are registered on Amazon, so be planning for that. Then on our prayer list, uh, some updates. Uh, there's been several uh, emails go out. And uh, I was on Facebook, and I sent an email out about our brother Rick Holden passing away early this morning. Uh, so need to remember the family. They're going to be uh, meeting tomorrow to work out the arrangements uh, for his funeral on that. But they did say they, they will be having the funeral here. They just don't know what day yet on that. And then Tal, uh, Talon McDaniel's got an arm injury. He's going to be seeing uh, the doctor Friday morning, so need prayers for him. And Vicki Holland is going to have cataract surgery tomorrow, so please remember her. And then uh, Wilford's uh, daughter, uh, she's had a biopsy and it's come back as breast cancer, and I think she's got some more tests to go through, uh, but please remember her in your prayers also. And then Melody Graham wasn't feeling well, went to the hospital here, she fell. Uh, wound up with a brain bleed. They airlifted her to Barnes, and she had surgery to relieve the pressure. And last I heard, she was unresponsive. Has any, Sarah, have you had an update? Okay, so, the, okay, that, that's the last we've heard then on her. So need to remember her and her family in your prayers also on that. Um, those are the updates I've got written down. Oh, uh, another item on Talon, he's graduating this year and I have his graduation announcement here and uh, I guess this is a uh, a kindergarten graduation on here, <laughs> Oh, I'll put this up out front, and uh, you need to look at the pictures here on that. But uh, he's got him hunting and, and playing baseball, too, just like his big brother. Actually, it's his big brother that's smaller <laughs> on that. But uh, remember, Talon's graduating this year, and it's graduation party. Uh, it's, uh, it says so on May the 4th at noon at Redmond Creek Pavilion at, at Lake Wapapella. So I'll put that up front. Anything else that needs to be mentioned? Okay, Don, Don Hover fell off, and they had to put pins in his arm and his surgery today on that and put pins in, in his arm. Okay, so need to remember Don also. Anything else? Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to study your word, dear Lord, to fellowship with 
other members of the church, Lord. We thank you so much for the family here at Green Forest. This time we'd like to pray for those of this congregation and others that are suffering from various physical problems, Melody, Don, Talon, Vicki, Kimberly. We'd especially at this time like to send a special prayer out to Rick Holden's family, dear Lord. We know we all love Rick. We all appreciate him. Him. He did so much to further your kingdom in his life, dear Lord. We pray that you'll be with them and comfort them as only you can. Lord, we pray that as we go throughout our lives, throughout this week, that we'll always honor you. We'll always do the things that we should to, and give you the glory for all that we've done. Lord, we pray that you'll give us remission of our sins, dear Lord. You pray that we'll always in everything we do, look to you for patience, guidance. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. The invitation song will be 335, 335, and we'll sing uh, 1, 2, and 4 on that. And when you have 335 marked, um, song before uh, William's lesson is 24. Two, four. The little flower that opens, the little bird that sings, God made their glowing colors, He made their tiny wings. All oh, things bright and beautiful, creatures great and small. All oh, things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The cold wind in the winter, the pleasant summer sun, the ripe fruits in the garden, he made them every one. All oh, things bright and beautiful, creatures great and small, all oh, things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. He gave us eyes to see them, and lips that we might tell. How great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. All things bright and beautiful, creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Amen. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good deal. Well, in case you missed it this week, we had an eclipse. <laughs> So, I didn't know if anyone, or I didn't know if everyone had heard or not. But uh, you know, after a little bit of work on Monday morning, I was fortunate enough to be able to take uh, my family out on the water, and they're in uh, Van Buren, Missouri. We got out and uh, watched the eclipse from the river. And you know, the eclipse here—it's been kind of interesting to see the build up to it, and to see how crazy everyone's been, kind of over it. I mean. It's even affected our family after looking at the eclipse. <laughs> we just go crazy. So, no, all joking aside though, um, the amount of people who came to our little corner of the world just to look at this clip is, is, eclipse is really um, astonishing to me. Um, this isn't from uh, Van Buren, but I'll say in, in Van Buren where I was at that day, I've never seen Highway 60 there in Van Buren have as much traffic as it did. Um, Monday. It was packed. There were people coming in all day long, coming through Van Buren, headed to all 
points around. This was actually uh, from the eclipse in New Hampshire. And I read online there was um, some individuals up there, they had thought they were going to have a three-hour trip home post-eclipse, and it took them 11 hours because of the gridlock. Just, just crazy. People crazy everywhere. Um, and thinking about the people and the craziness, you know, um, made me think of several things. But one of the things that, um, you know, we did during the eclipse or something that came to my mind as we were watching it was I set Will aside and we talked about God creating the eclipse. So I want to share a couple passages with you, just some of my thought processes as we were um, experiencing the day, so to speak. So first passage here is from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 14, a very familiar passage to us. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night, and let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And it's a familiar passage. We all, um, everyone here knows that and understands that. But, you know, I think so many people, as I was thinking about the clip, so many people are coming, looking at this thing, and they're, they're looking for something else. They're thinking of something else. They're not recognizing the creator who made this. Um, but, in the, but in that thought, you know, there's people coming and they're searching. They're searching for something. They're looking for something. And it led me to this um, passage, another familiar passage for us, in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, if you turn over there, picking up in verse 22, we have Paul, and he is before... He's in Athens, and he's before this, uh, this place or this group, this gathering called the um, Aragopagus, or Ar- 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 however you say that word. He's in front of this group in Athens, and he, you know, he's, he's talking to people who are searching, seeking something, looking for something. Here's what Paul has to say, or here's, here's what it says here in Acts 17, starting in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I have passed along and observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples made by man, Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and we have our being. As even some of your own prophets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think of the divine being as like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul's talking to these learned men of Athens. He's conveying to them that despite all their knowledge, despite all their desire for um, to be religious, there's only one true and living God, the God who created heaven and earth, who created the eclipse that we were all blessed to see on Monday, who set things in order and motion that we can't even comprehend or understand. Um, that's who Paul is articulating to these people. And so, you know, it, it, it speaks to me, you know, so many people come to look at this eclipse for a whole variety of reasons. And, and I'm not saying that a lot of people come seeking it as a religious experience per se, but people are constantly, the world around us is seeking answers to life, meaning of life, what it is, looking up, trying to understand what their purpose is, why they're here. 
And, you know, we had a great display of God's order and creation on Monday that we know God created for us. Um, and so one final passage before we close tonight from John chapter 1, verses 1 and 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of the men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, he is the answer to what everyone in this world is looking for. Um, without Jesus, the eclipse we saw, just saw could not have been, would not have been. In him is life. Um, and if you're looking for life, if you're looking for the answers in this crazy world, it's only through Jesus Christ. So tonight you have an opportunity. If you want to make your life right, you can come forward, you can put on Christ in baptism, or you can ask for forgiveness of sins. You have that opportunity tonight. As together we stand and sing. Heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, seeking to know the reason why he should love me so, why he should stoop to lift me up from the miry clay, saving my soul, making me whole. Though I had wandered away into the will of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, praying for grace to follow, seeking his way to know, bowing in full surrender, Lo, at his blessed feet, bidding him take, break me and make, till I am molded and meet into the joy of Jesus. Deeper and deeper I go, rising with soul enraptured, far from the world below, joy in the place of sorrow, peace in the midst of pain. Jesus will give, Jesus will give, he will uphold and sustain. Amen. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, class time. Testing, testing. Is it? Can you hear me? Am I coming through? That? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Good evening again. <laughs> Hope everybody is doing well tonight. We are in Second Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, we'll be picking up in verse 12, or chapter 1, verse 12, excuse me. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 is where we're starting off tonight. Um, just a little recap from last week. We introduced uh, 2 Corinthians, the book. Um, talked about some of the differences between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is written as um, Paul is giving, I'll say, strong guidance and direction and correction to the church at Corinth. Um, and after that, he's following up here with 2 Corinthians. Um, and it's much more of an encouraging letter, a very personal letter. Um, Paul's been kind of pained by the church here at Corinth, and so we're going to explore some of that tonight. Um, but, but last week, we really focused on the idea of um, God's comfort for Paul, and then in turn, God's comfort uh, for us. So tonight, picking up there in, chap or in verse 12, excuse me, um, and what we're going to kind of cover tonight is Paul an incident or a, an issue that uh, the Corinthians have with Paul, Paul's made a change in plans. Whoever makes a change in their travel plans? Am I the only one? I'm a habitual plan changer, and it drives my wife crazy. <laughs> Had a little talk about this. Um, so... But Paul has a lot better reason for changing plans than I do. Um, I am notorious for uh, just going with the flow. Like the things I want to do, which is revolve around hunting and fishing, it's all about like what's the weather, you know. If it's, it's a little cloudy, I might want to go fish. If it's sunshiny, I might want to go hunt or who, who knows, whatever. Whatever the case is, I'm a habitual plan changer. But anyway, um, we're looking at an issue here that the Corinthians have with Paul. Um, they're, they're, they have apparently called him out on his change of plans to come visit them. They're upset about it, and Paul's making a defense uh, for himself. Um, and so with that, I think rather than reading through the whole text um, to start, we're just going to go piece by piece here for the sake of time. And so starting in verse 12, for our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely toward you. Let me, I meant to say this um, in my opening here. Um, so all my text up here is always, I generally read from the ESV, um, but I also, I look at the New American Standard a lot just to try to help me compare and understand. Um, one of the challenges I found on the text we're going through tonight is actually, I don't want to say divergence, but the, the, um, the, the people who translate those different, the ESV and the New American Standard, there's some differences. And so one of those differences that I've got highlighted here, the ESV calls out simplicity. Um, the New American Standard calls out holiness. And that actually goes back to a difference um, difference between early manuscripts. And so I'm not going to pretend to be smart enough or intelligent enough to speak on that, but I, I just wanted to highlight that, that point. Um, but as far as this passage goes, well, let's, let's talk about this. Paul is highlighting here, he has a, um, a clear conscience towards the Corinthians here. Even though they're upset that he's changed his travel plans, Paul's saying, you know, the testimony of our conscience is that we've behaved. He, he's, he's starting off with a broad brush here. But he's, we have behaved in the world towards the Corinthians and, and everyone Paul's conducting um, or in contact with, but with simplicity and godly sincerity. Um, you know, and when Paul says, when, it's, when it talks about, for our boast is in this, Paul isn't bragging per se. Like we, when we use the word boast, we think that's kind of a bragging term. He's, he's saying that um, he, he's secure in the knowledge of how he behaved. He knows he has behaved correctly. It's not a, a pride, it, it, it doesn't carry a negative connotation like we might think of the word boast. He, he's saying he has behaved appropriately um, towards them. And he's behaved with this simplicity or holiness and godly sincerity. Um, and so as we read and try to understand this passage, I don't think that, I think simplicity, living a simplistic life is obviously a Christian, um, that's something that's biblical, that's something that we can look and, and find examples of in scripture, as well as obviously living a holy life. And so, 
Um, I think both could be applied here. But I think the, the thing I, I know to take away from this is when it talks about Paul having godly sincerity towards them, what does that mean when we hear that term? What, what's it like to behave with godly sincerity towards someone? What comes to y'all's mind? Okay, able to understand it. Okay. What else? If, I, if, if you say, um, I'm a sincere person, what? I, don't, I shouldn't say that. That's not a good example. But when, when someone is a sincere person, what, what comes to mind about them? Genuine. Genuine, pure, very good. Um, yeah, and I think that's what Paul's, conveying here. He's, his motives have been genuine. They've been pure. The things he's trying to do for the Corinthians are for their benefit. And we're going to see as we go on, his reason for not coming to them is he feels for their benefit. So let's move, let's move on here. Verses 13 and 14, for we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us as we will boast of you. Um, so Paul has previously written to the first Corinthians. Um, and in his letter to the first Corinthians, he planned to come visit them. In first Corinthians 16, he writes, starting in verse five, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. For I intend to pass through Macedonia and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. So Paul planned to come visit them. But again, his plans have changed. And so when Paul had penned those words in 1 Corinthians, he meant them. He was sincere. He had every intention of fulfilling them. Um... But his, his plans change. Things come up. Circumstances change. Things happen. That doesn't call into question Paul's character or his authority as apostle, which is um, something that's going to come, we're going to see later on in the book. Um, you know, as we, we end this section here, um, Paul, he doesn't want the church to be disappointed that he was unable to come, but but rather he wants the Corinthians to be boastful, to be proud of him, just as he is of them. He wants to have this mutual um, relationship of encouraging and uplifting each other, and he's, he's not getting that from the Corinthians. Questions or thoughts before we move on? I don't know. I have those same questions, and, and I was going. We can talk about that now. I was going to get to it here in a little bit, but I mean, if you think about the church at Corinth, Paul has established that church. He comes there, and he, you know, in First Corinthians, he talks about all these miraculous gifts. You know, they have speaking in tongues, healing powers, um, prophecy, all, all these different special gifts, wisdom, knowledge. He has been had to have been a key component in giving them those gifts and establishing that church, and yet they question him. And so I don't, I don't know why they do it necessarily. And so, you know, now, and while I don't understand their motives, I think taking a step back, it's always easy for us to question leaders and their motives and their intent, especially if it doesn't go just our way. And I think that's what we're seeing some of here. I mean, they're acting, you know, uh, well, and think about it, too, from this standpoint. The Corinthians, um, this, this letter is written just a year, year and a half after 1 Corinthians. Um, they've not been a church. They've not been Christians that long. They're still 
learning and growing, they're, they're still, I think, to a certain degree, children. And I think, you know, that's manifest in the first letter, and they've, they, I think they've grown some since that first letter and corrected things, but they're, they're not acting as they should in questioning Paul and, and, and questioning his authority. I mean, and that's a big theme throughout the book is his, they question his authority, or, or he, he is expounding on his authority as an apostle because it's been questioned. So. Yeah. He, he had left them, and now one little thing. By the way, changing your plans that is really no big deal. I mean, I don't think so. Other parties. I'm not seeing it. No, <laughs> no, really, he got distance from them. So if you find if there's one person that maybe was jealous of him or something, they could create some um, controversy that probably could Well, and you also have people here who are effectively being false apostles or claiming to be apostles and not. So... They're likely driving that wedge. Yeah. Wilfred, you were going to say something. Here in this passage, he's going to, yeah. Well, the, the author of that book said that uh, he may have purposely changed his direction after he sent that first letter to them because he was getting after them quite a bit. All the problems that we've discussed that were there, you know, he had something to, to tell them about each of those. So the, the, the author was thinking that maybe he's given them more time to think about it and maybe to repent. Mm -hmm. Well, then he goes on to say that when Timothy got there, Timothy brought the report that they had repented. Now, I know I didn't make that up, and I know I've slept since I read that, so what? maybe somebody else has read something similar. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. There's kind of some, I'm not going to say confusion, but it's it's um, maybe a little bit ambiguous as Paul's travel plan. So Paul's in Ephesus. They th there's some language in here that might indicate that he made a quick trip to visit them after writing 1 Corinthians, but then goes back to Ephesus. And then I think it's unclear at that time whether they've cleared it up or not, but it seems to indicate that that's been a painful visit. And we'll, we'll get to that, some more of that here in a little bit um, and talk about that more as we get further down in the text. Any other questions or comments before we um, move on here? Let me make sure. Yes, Terry. Verse 13, mm -hmm. basically he's coming back, he's saying, you all know the deal, I shouldn't have to add or take away. Yeah, yeah, he, he's an apostle, he, he has the authority to change his plans and they shouldn't really question him on it, um, yeah, but, but also verse 13, you know, his intent was always there, what he wrote them, he intended to do, it's just changed. Just changed. So let's move on. Verse 15. Because of this, I wish, because I was so sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. Again, Paul's original plan was to come see the Corinthians. We're not sure as the details as to, we, we have some, we can infer some things as to why his plans changed, but um, the exact details on why it changed, we don't know. But he intended to come to see them. Um, Uh-huh. Uh, I'm not sure what this author used, but anyway, he says you might have a double pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I think I messed up. Yeah, I messed up here. Verse, this is supposed to be verse 16. It's not on the slide. My apologies. But it says in verse 16, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. And that's, Wilford, I think, what you were talking about earlier. Um, he... He's had these travel plans. He, he's wanted to come see them, but again, he has not been able to. Um, verse 17, 18 here. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say, excuse me, yes and yes, 
and no, no at the same time. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. Real quick, what does it mean when Paul says vacillating? What's he implying here when he says vacillating? Wishy-washy, indecisive, hesitant, fickle, wavering. Um, he's not saying, he, he's not wishy-washy. He, again, this is part of this being a personal letter from Paul. He sincerely wants to come see the, the Corinthians, but he doesn't. He has a change in plans. Um, and he, again, he's saying, you know, as God is faithful, our word to you has been has not been yes or no. Our word to you has been faithful. And so, um, interesting here, uh, effectively, I think in verse 18, Paul's taking an oath um, on God to, to illustrate his seriousness in this matter. Um, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. I mean, Paul is, I think that's as emphatic as he can make it, that he intended to be with them, intended to come um, see them. And so we've talked about a couple different things um, with regarding his travel plans. So last week um, when we introduced 2 Corinthians, we talked about the trouble that Paul faced in Ephesus, right? So um, Paul had been in Ephesus for about two years. Everything had been going well. His ministry had been going good. And then all of a sudden there was an uprising of the silversmiths. They're very upset that he is um, you know, effectively taking away their business. He's cutting into their profits. Um, and so they create this big uprising in town, and they, you know, bring everyone to this big um, amphitheater-like area and are chanting and holding um, some of Paul's, some, some fellow Christians of Paul's um, captive. And, and so it's a very disturbing thing for Paul. We think that's um, some of the experiences being pointed to there in chapter 1 um, or early in this chapter. And so, you know, Paul had reason to change his plans, and that could have been a part of it. Um, we're going to see later on that, in part, he does it because of them, effectively because they're not ready to see him. Um, verses 19 and 20. We're moving through this pretty fast, so if you have questions please or comments, please don't hesitate to, to stop me. Uh-huh. Say that, say that again. <laughs> so, so Paul actually changed his plans because God had a plan for him that he could not foresee. He had decided that he wanted to do this, but that wasn't in, the, in God's plan. So he had to follow what he felt was right or what God was telling him to do. Is why he stayed and didn't come back. Hey. I think what he's articulating there is that, you know, he's saying, do I make my plans according to the flesh? Is that, that when he's talking about that? When he make, he's saying that, do I make my plans according to the flesh? That's a rhetorical question. Yeah. And he's saying no. Like, I think his plans are always, right. he's always desiring to do God's plan. And I think to your point, yeah. it wasn't God's plan for him to come see them at yeah. this next. Yeah. 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 Very good. Thank you. Um, Verses 19 and 20 here. For the, Son of, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Um, as Paul's shifting gears here just slightly, he's going from talking about um, the, the event, the interaction that he's having with the Corinthians, to make a very, um, very clear and important doctrinal statement here. Um, you know, the Corinthians, they should know that everything that Paul has said to them, 
that he meant. Um, and it was because his yes was always a yes, and because what Paul and Timothy and Silvanus, or Silas, we assume, um, has been, it's because they've been sharing with them Jesus Christ, in whom it is always yes. Um, meaning that in Jesus is always truth, and Jesus is always truth. And that kind of, actually, you know, I liked how they, this kind of, my, my thoughts on the, the eclipse and, and, you know, Jesus being all the answers, it's, it's, it's the same thing Paul's articulating here that he articulated to um, the Aragopas there in Athens that John articulates in 1 John. Everything hinges on Jesus. Um, but in, in Jesus are all the promises of God, and they all find their yes, or they all find truth in him. Um, yeah, and so we already kind of mentioned this, but, you know, to think that Paul's having to um, deal with the Corinthians on this issue of just something as simple as change of travel plans, that this is obviously a sticking point for them, that he's having to articulate why. Um, when he's bestowed them with spiritual gifts, he's, he's brought the gospel to them. Um, he's, an, he's an apostle of God. He is a special um, individual, one of only 12 people to get that you know, unique and special designation. Um, and for them to question him over something so trivial or so silly. Um, but effectively, they shouldn't be questioning him because, you know, um, he's been proclaiming the gospel to them. He's not told them anything wrong. He's always shared um, God's will with them. True. I don't think they were worshiping Paul. <laughs> but saying like to just remember that that's yeah. that's who, you know, even though That's who he's always pointing to. In everything he's doing. He's trying to and we talked about this last week too. Um, you know, whether Paul was in good times or bad times, he was using whatever situation he was in his ministry to further the cause of Christ. Um, however it was. So thank you. Um Moving on again, verse 21, 22. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Um, Paul and his fellow workers in Corinth and the church in Corinth have been established together and therefore united in Christ by God. Um, but Paul goes on to say that God has anointed them what does this mean, this idea? What's, what's, what's Paul talking about when he says um, they, God has anointed us? Who's the us and what's the anointing? They're in the us, I think, yeah. How are they anointed? How are they anointed? What does it mean? And, you know, when it talks about, and they've been anointed or has anointed us. And it is God who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us. What's this anointing? Okay. He was, yes, yes, okay. Other thoughts? I. No. <laughs> uh, chosen. Okay. Okay. And how are they anointed with the Holy Spirit? Through baptism, right? And so this... So it, I, I agree with everything that's being said. I, I'm not the master of this. I, I, don't, I won't pretend to fully know and understand everything. Um, but from what I can read and understand, so that if it's here, it's very plausible that when it talks about, you know, and has anointed us, um, 
the idea of being anointed in baptism, um, that's when they would have received the, the Spirit. They would have been given the Spirit. Um, and, but also, if that is the true interpretation, it's the only, way, only place in the New Testament that references or ties baptism to being um, anointed. Um, but effectively, it's a part of, it's this idea of they've done something or somehow been bestowed upon them this um, election which gives them the Holy Spirit. Question, Jeremy? I, I couldn't hear what Shirley said. Sure, but, um, and, and she made a mention, but this makes me think of Paul uh, when he's on the road to Damascus. Uh, and he goes, he goes, goes on into the city, blinded, he's waiting on Ananias. God tells Jesus to speak to Ananias and says, You're going to go to Paul. You're going to show him these things. And I admit that I've chosen to be this. Mm-hmm. And could it be, could, could the us there then be the apostles in general? Yeah. And not necessarily Timothy and Sylvanus? That's what I would think. Okay. Okay. But it, but it could be them as well. It, I don't think it's clear for us. It's not clear to me. Um, I don't think it's a huge doctrinal point. Either. No, no, I would, I would agree with that. Um, any other questions or comments on that before we move on here? Um, because we're running low on time. <laughs> 23 and 24. But I call God to witness against me. It was not... So, so before I read through this, this is where Paul's talking about why he didn't come to him. Verse 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was not to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. Um... You know, God is his witness. Paul, he was, he was, he did not come to Corinth again. He did not make the second trip, um, or the, or this trip that they're referencing that they're obviously upset about. He, he did not come, or the reason he did not go was to spare them. He knew for some reason they weren't ready, um, or it was not going to be beneficial for him to visit. Um, it's likely that they're still processing and working through 1 Corinthians. It's likely that there are divisions in that church that they need to work out because there's individuals who claim to be apostles who are not, or there's false teachers in that church. There's issues that they are still working through that, for whatever reason, Paul, through the Spirit, believes it's not beneficial to come to them to Corinth um, at this time. And so he's not saying, you know, we're not doing this um, to lord it over your faith. We're, we're not, we're, you know, we're not doing this to, to punish you or to um, make you feel less than, um, but we're doing this, um, you know, effectively for your long-term joy and for your growth in faith. Um, questions or comments on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the, we're going to, let's go, let's go on here to verses 1 through 3. Because really, as we enter into chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it's kind of bringing all this to a head really quick and, and getting more into what you're talking about there. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And as I... And, and I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. 
And so that, that kind of speaks to your point there. Um, and a, a passage I had selected here to kind of go with that, Paul's, Paul has faced a lot um, from the Corinthians. We're going to read later on in chapter, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 16. It says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish. Um, they're, they're thinking Paul is foolish for some reason. But even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will too boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. I think Paul's indicating here, highlighting here, he's, he's received definitely um, emotional humiliation from the church here at Corinth, um, and, and even possibly physical humiliation. I mean, it, they've, it's possible that they, he's been struck in the face, or they've, they've struck another brother in Christ um, in the face. So the, coming to them would have been a painful visit. Um, and Paul's, he's already made, um, so where, where it says in verse one here, this is what I was alluding to earlier where I talked about, it's possible that Paul makes a quick visit to Corinth while he's been at Ephesus, um, that's not recorded in Acts or anywhere in scripture. Cause in verse, verse one, it says, for I made up my mind not to make another painful visit. So they thought he was coming back again. Um, and we have no indication in what's recorded in Acts on Paul's visit to Corinth that there was anything painful. He comes in, he establishes the church, and he you know, moves on rather quickly. But um, there's nothing to indicate painful. Um, but it seems as though he's made a previous painful visit where he's had these harsh interactions with them, um, where he's struggling with them. And so... Um, Yeah, yeah. So he's 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 made a trip, it seems, and we just don't know about it. And so, and I, one commentary I read, it speculated that that visit was so harsh that um, Luke had left it out of Acts. And, and so we, we don't we don't know. That's pure speculation, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, and that's um, we're gonna we're gonna end here on verse four tonight, I think, because um, I got another point I want to make after the end. But Second um, Corinthians chapter two, verse four: For I wrote you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Um, obvious, so Paul, he's, he's made a painful visit to them. He's written 1 Corinthians, which I would say is a painful letter for him to write and to have delivered to them. Um, and I think this speaks a lot to, obviously, Paul's, um, well, going back to something we talked about earlier in the lesson, Paul's godly sincerity. So for Paul to be sincere, you have to tell the truth. Standing for the truth is a part of sincerity. But it doesn't mean you relish in knowing that you've hurt people. It, it causes Paul great much, much affliction and anguish of heart to have to do the things he needs to do to be a leader to this church, to be an apostle to this church. Um, I think that's no different than what our church leaders would face today if, if you had to correct an individual. It's out of anguish and hurt and tears. It's not something that you do lightly. It's not something you want to do. Um, and I think we see this very human side of Paul here in having to um, 
do that and having to do what needs to be done. Um, thoughts or comments on that? And that's where I was going next. When we talk about abundant love, um, in 1 Corinthians, amid all this rebuke, he talks about love. And what is, what is love? 1 Corinthians 13, real quick. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The abundant love Paul has for them, he, he has to do things that he obviously does not want to do to address them, but he does it because he loves them. So, anyway, thank you for your comments. Um, that was the second bell, I think, right? Okay. <laughs> Everyone have a good week.